My name is Jun Chol Park from Yonsei University. Uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Professor Joseph Sung from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Hi, Professor uh, Sung. Hi, Dr. Park. Okay. So I'm representing the APDD community. Uh, I sincerely thank you for participating this year, and I really think I uh, accept him this interview. Sure. Uh, I believe gastroenterologists uh, who is watching this interview will recognize you well because you are uh, very uh, superstar in this field. So, <laughs> and you will be spending a very busy uh, this year. There are three, I, I think, three assigned lecture in this APDW. So, first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the session, the overview of recent progress in the upper GI disease, especially your uh, title is management of peptic ulcer disease. So, uh, what's the important point for us to recognize dealing with this also disease? Just comment some. Yeah, in not. this particular lecture, I in fact uh, focus on upper GI bleeding mm -hmm. uh, due to peptic ulcer disease. And in the Asia Pacific region, uh, we have recently published a new guideline mm -hmm. on the management yeah. of peptic ulcer bleeding. Uh, there are several points that I have highlighted in this lecture that includes uh, a restricted blood transfusion strategy yes. seems to benefit our patient. Uh, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, we still advocate to offer patients uh, endoscopy within 24 hours mm -hmm. uh, after they present to hospital. But there is probably no need to make it even earlier because the earlier you perform endoscopy, the more therapeutic procedure mm -hmm. you might need to perform yes. for the patient. But that does not translate into better clinical outcome of the mm. patient. So anything within 24 hours should be enough, except for very special case. For example, the patient uh, is in hemodynamic shock or the patient is vomiting a lot of blood. <clears throat> that indicates inside there is active bleeding, which cannot be controlled by um, conservative method. Then you may require to perform endoscopy earlier. I spare quite a bit of time to discuss about uh, the use of aspirin mm -hmm. and anticoagulating agent, particularly uh, the newer generation, the so-called NOAC, mm -hmm. newer yeah. oral anticoagulants. Uh, these drugs are getting more and more commonly used because our patient with peptic ulcer bleeding is getting older and older. So um, I, I discuss about when this patient who takes aspirin or other antiplatelet agent or NOAC, when they comes in with GI bleeding, what should we do? Mm. Uh, to cut the long story short, I think our study as well as others have indicated that you should perhaps stop the anticoagulant and stop the antiplatelet, but only for a short time. As soon as the patient is stabilized, either in day three or day four, we should resume them on this medication. Because although antiplatelet or anticoagulant will increase the risk of bleeding, but if you stop them for a prolonged period, the mortality is actually higher, and that is because of uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular complications. Mm -hmm. I think the major message that I want to relate to the audience is that if patient takes antiplatelet or anticoagulant and present with GI bleeding, we should withhold this drug, but no more than three days. three days. Because if we hold them for a longer period, the mortality is actually higher. So I uh, also joined your, your lecture. I very uh, enjoy it. And, uh, you uh, slightly touched the new modality, like hemostatic spray, the powder. So uh, could you comment more that how is the, uh, the possibility to control the peptic also disease with hemostatic spray or hemostatic powder, something like that? Mm. Yeah, uh, the hemostatic spray or powder actually is a chemical that will swell on exposure to moisture and it will cause platelet aggregation mm. and therefore pluck the bleeding blood vessel. Uh, it has been tried uh, in our center uh, as the first human study to use it in peptic ulcer bleeding and it seems to be working quite well to stop um, active bleeding. However, it should only be used as a temporary treatment mm -hmm. or a stopgap treatment mm -hmm. because after a few hours or up to 24 hours, this powder will be washed away. Yeah. So if nothing is done on this uh, bleeding source, patients will have recurrence of bleeding mm -hmm. almost absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
So this should be used as a uh, temporary measure. But it's also found to be useful in other possible sources of bleeding, such as cancer of the yeah, stomach right. yeah. or hemorrhagic gastritis. So I think they are good because they are easy to use and they seem to be uh, quite versatile. Yeah, that's right. So most uh, <coughs> advantage for hemostatic powder or spray is uh, very easy to use for, for not a uh, very high experience endoscopy, yeah. uh, so the beginner can use easily. Yeah. Do you have it here in Korea? Yes, I'm no. uh, right now. I'm studying for uh, endoclot uh, mm -hmm. most uh, powder. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing right, I'm right now a prospect study in our institution right, right. now. So I have a. Uh, I also have some uh, good point, but there are some limitations. For uh, just you mentioned that it was uh, easily wash away from if the active link is like, so fast like that. So mm. that's the main uh, limitation. But it is the, if we use the injection or another uh, modality, it is very uh, helpful to control the bleeding, yeah. especially the fellow training. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, okay. So let's move on to another topic. Uh, you also um, uh, lecture about the uh, uh, chlorhexidine neoplasm. There's a recent progress on translation research in chlorhexidine neoplasm. So, uh, your uh, special lecture is a, a novel biomarker of chlorhexidine cancer screening. Can you comment about mm -hmm. uh, that? Yeah, actually, I give two lectures on biomarkers for yeah, colorectal cancer yeah. diagnosis. The first one, I focus only on the, the use of microbiome mm. uh, as a marker. Because we know that patients with colorectal cancer, they have special types of bacteria which is more um, common, more prevalent. And it also exists in higher um, quantity compared to the other bacteria. Mm -hmm. So our group has identified uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum together with a few other markers that may be useful as a uh, early diagnosis or even a screening tool. But this kind of study needs to be validated with a much larger sample mm -hmm. size because microbiome in patients from different regions and different country okay. uh, having different diet might be quite different. Yeah, right. So we will need to validate this result. Uh, the second lecture, um, which I'm going to give in, in about an hour's mm -hmm. time, I, I will review on the other biomarker that has been uh, investigated, mm -hmm. including the stew-based uh, multi-target DNA uh, uh, stew marker, uh, the Cologuard, or Septin 9, mm -hmm. or some micro RNA marker that we have uh, investigated. Mm -hmm. I think by and large, uh, these markers looks promising. They have to uh, benchmark against uh, FIT, mm -hmm. uh, which is the fecal immunochemical test for occult blood because that is now the gold standard mm -hmm. and it's uh, found to be reliable and, uh, well, uh, it's affordable. So uh, every other biomarker will have to benchmark against FIT in order to uh, substantiate uh, its place in the screening program of colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, uh, and finally, I have a, a personal question for you that your words are very amazing, to especially to me and young doctors. You're uh, leading the gastroenterologist field's basic to endoscopic interventions. So, mm. uh, how is it? Uh, how do how do, how do you do that? Uh, lots of the study and basic research to the endoscopy interventions and like that. Please give us some uh, your advice or tip to especially young doctors, young researchers. Well, um, I, I, I must say that uh, I'm very lucky to be able to work with a group of young and talented people. Mm -hmm. So what I have done over the years is try to uh, identify from the medical students who are the top and brightest uh, students, <laughs> and then I would um, invite them to join uh, our team. Mm -hmm. And then I will also uh, suggest to them that, well, maybe this is a very fruitful area for research and for your career development. Mm -hmm. So for example, Henry Chen, who just gave the Okuda lecture, uh, we suggest him to study viral hepatitis. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Francis Chen, who is now the Dean of Medicine, uh, his specialty is in NSAID and um, aspirin and so on. So we identify area of interest and give them 
um, plenty of opportunities to develop his interests and uh, and also make him famous uh, in his own field. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad that they are all doing quite well. Oh, so <coughs> you, you say lucky, but I think uh, your your team is excellent. Also, you're. Uh, very uh, good leaders, I think. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for uh, again for your uh, kind interview. Thank you. Thank you.